Welcome to the Adoption and Foster Care Journey, a podcast to encourage, educate, and equip you to care for children and youth through adoption, foster, and kinship care. Hosted by an adoptive mom with over 22 years of kinship and adoptive parenting experience, she's on this journey with you. Please welcome Sandra Flack. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, by great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, and genuine love. That is 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. Uh, welcome to the Adoption and Foster Care Journey podcast. I am Sandra, Sandra Flack. Um, so grateful to have you with me today. This is our first episode of September, which is National FASD Awareness Month, FASD Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorders. And I am proud to announce that JFO, my nonprofit, is a proud platinum sponsor of RUN FASD, the annual event uh, raising awareness about FASD, working to make this invisible disability visible. So you can join participants across the country. You can go to runfasd.org to find out where there are in-person 5Ks or events in your state, because this is a national event. Uh, You can also um, just go on out and run, walk, bicycle, bring the family, bring the kids, um, gather with a group, or just do it yourself. Snap a selfie and hashtag run FASD. Um, It's just a time anytime throughout the month of September to bring awareness again to make this invisible disability visible. Today, I have an adoptive mom guest who um, has children with NFASD. She's also not only a parent, but a professional. Um, So we're going to be getting to that shortly. But first, check out these announcements. Natalie Vecchione of the FASD Hope Podcast and Sandra Flack of the Adoption and Foster Care Journey Podcast would like to invite you to join their Hope for the FASD Journey, a virtual support community for parents and caregivers raising individuals with an FASD, diagnosed or not. This faith-based community includes an online bi-monthly support group, a monthly VIP conversation, and a private Facebook group which includes a video devotional from Natalie and Sandra every Saturday. To register, visit justicefororphansny.org forward slash training forward slash F-A-S-D. And I am so grateful for our Hope for the FASD Journey virtual support community. Um, I hope that you will check that out. I know myself uh, and Natalie Vecchione of FASD Hope Podcast, we just value this group. We as two moms on this journey need this support group um, just as much as all of our fellow uh, community members. So I hope that you will check it out. Um, I've also got some great online workshops focusing on FASD coming up that you could take advantage of. Um, I have a a, a one hour FASD introduction. It's an intro to FASD that is coming up on Wednesday, September 27th at 7 p.m. Eastern time. And if you'd really like to go deep into FASD using the FACETS neurobehavioral model, beginning on Wednesday, October, let me look so I don't say the wrong time, October 11th at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, This is a, it's 18 hours of content. So it is six three-hour workshops every Wednesday night consecutively starting on October 11th. Uh, And it goes into November a little bit. Again, it's it's 18 hours worth of content. It's a, it's a deep dive. So I hope you'll check that out. We do offer certificates of completion for everybody who participates in any of the workshops. 
And if you are a social worker licensed in New York State, which is where we are based, um, we also offer CEUs as well. To register for any of our online workshops, you would just go to our website, justicefororphansny.org, um, and you can either click on register at the top of the page or click on training, and then you'll see in the drop down the FASD tab. And if you go there, you'll get a whole list of the trainings that are up and coming or those that might be available in the future. Lots of opportunity there, lots of resources. Uh, we'll put a link in the show notes so you can get right to the website easily. So I hope that you'll check it out. Also, please subscribe or follow this podcast so you don't miss a single episode, um, especially if you are an adoptive foster or kinship caregiver raising a child or children prenatally exposed to drugs or alcohol. Um, this is a vital resource for you. And we want to keep you encouraged and equipped for the journey. So now to our guest, uh, Lynn Alsup holds a Master of Social Work degree and a certificate in Spiritual Direction. She's a certified facilitator of the FACETS Neurobehavioral Model and the FACETS Program Director. Lynn's powerful book, I have it right here, Tinderbox, One Family's Story of Adoption, Neurodiversity, and Fierce Love, um, is just released, super excited. Uh, and she lives in West Texas with her husband and three extraordinary neurodiverse daughters. So please welcome to the show, Lynn Alsup. Hi, Lynn. Hi there, Sandra. Well, I am so excited to have you on the show. I just finished your book, Tinderbox. I couldn't put it down. And now I'm so excited for our listeners to get to, to know you and to hear your story um, because it's just, I just love the way you unpacked the whole book and, and we'll get to all of that shortly. But um, let's just start at the beginning of your story. What what led you and your husband, Jeff, to pursue adoption? Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much um, for having me today and letting me talk about it. Um, we, you know, we wanted to start a family and, um, we're not able to biologically, we didn't actually know that that was completely true before our first adoption, but it was increasingly clear. Um, and we were actually working at a nonprofit at the time that did some work in Haiti and in Mexico and India. And so we'd been traveling and, and working in these um, other countries. And we really fell in love with Haiti, just the strength and beauty of the people and um, the land in a lot of ways. It really captured our hearts. And through our work there, we, um, you know, serendipitously got connected to a couple who'd lived there for a long time, an American couple. And um, yeah, and Claire came into our lives that way. And it just felt really clear that it was what we were meant to do. Um, we had a lot of, you know, we struggled with the complexities of international adoption and justice issues of poverty and how all of those things impact huge groups of people and what our response should be to that. Um, but as I say in the book, ultimately we decided for this one particular child, um, it, it was ours to do to bring her home and create a family that way. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And I, and I, I've entered, I've entered, I've, my husband and I have adopted internationally as well, if I can get that out. Yeah. Um, so I can, I can Great. appreciate one of the things that, that, that stuck with me because you're, the, the, the process was challenging. You went, mm -hmm. you met Claire, you spent time with her, you bonded with her, and then you had to leave her there and then eventually yeah. be able yeah. to go back for her, which causes more trauma in, in a child. And, Absolutely. And, um, and I can understand, you know, because a lot of times with international adoption, it, it certain countries, it is more than one trip and it's so confusing and it's yeah. so hard and it causes, it causes more damage. And, and one of our, yeah. you know, we adopted three siblings, found out about a fourth 
and wanted the fourth, but he wasn't yet available. And so we had to wait until the country, until Ukraine allowed us to go back for him. And yeah, I think he was 14 months old when we found out about him. And by the time they allowed us to go get him, he was five and had spent all yeah. five of his years in an orphanage. So just, you know, right. it's the injustice of it. Yeah. Um, it and is so complicated. Suffer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. And I think for us too, um, in our work in Haiti, just understanding the poverty in Haiti and the way the enslavement of the people there really started a cycle of poverty um, that meant that some people weren't able to care for their children, you know, and really wanting to be able to be a part of helping somehow to right some, well, I don't know if we can ever right some of those wrongs, but, you know, to address some of that so that the people of Haiti don't have to be in that position where they're not able to parent their own children. Um, yeah, there's a lot of complexity to it. Yeah. Absolutely. And we ended up, um, our adoption was a private adoption, a private international adoption, which is completely insane. I would not recommend that to anyone. It was just the way it happened to unfold for us because of our work there. But so we didn't really understand the laws or, you know, the process, all of that. And we didn't have an agency that was helping us navigate all of that. So, yeah, it was quite a it was it was about a year and quite a, a journey for all of us, especially for Claire. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us about and I know you have permission. We'll say that from the beginning, uh, permi- you yeah. have permission from your children to write the book and to speak the story. Um, so tell yeah. us about bringing Claire home. What was that like? What? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I appreciate you mentioning that. It, I definitely do go through um, lots of conversations with our kids as I teach and um, talk about different stories from our home. And they've been incredibly supportive. And definitely in writing the book, that was a, a much bigger question of how do I share this story in a way that honors them? And um, yeah, I, I went through lots of steps with bringing in advocates and trying to figure all of that out, how to to share the story in a way that um, would be meaningful for other people and also okay for my kids, you know? Yeah. Um, so yes, absolutely. I do have their permission to talk about the things that I talk about. Um, so Claire was a year old when she came home. And I think like most families, in adoption, we just believed that it would be hard and we would love her well enough that everything would be okay. You know, it just, um, yeah, but she was, uh, 13 months old when she came home. I had lived with her in Haiti with this couple that I mentioned for a couple months during the process. And we'd been back and forth a bunch. And, um, then she was yeah a year old when she came home and, you know, she is an incredibly um, strong and resilient young woman now. She's 24 now, um, just an extraordinary person. And she was struggling. I mean, there were, um, she's has lots of exuberance and joy, and she just lights up a room, any room she walks into, which has been the case since she walked off the airplane at one year old. <laughs> you know, it was... <laughs> She's, um, yeah, she's a firecracker. And, um, and that was lots of joy and fun. And also a lot of franticness and, um, and fear on her part. And that first year, you know, I, I write in the book that we, or I specifically so much wanted to just sort of slide into life as a family, as if, we'd been together all along and we loved each other so much. Everything was great. And I, I knew about trauma. I mean, I'm a social worker, but um, that was way before any talk of trauma informed care or any of that was really um, 
even studied in like in my graduate program, we didn't talk a whole lot about that then. Um, so we just were shocked and we tried to be loving parents that were, you know, had consequences and discipline and lots and lots of love and grace. And, um, and it just didn't work. <laughs> you know, it just continued really to unravel regardless what we did. So there were lots of extremes of extreme joy. And, and also I think to the adoption community, you know, there, there was very much this sense of, I've been longing for this, for family. I've been longing to be a mom. I've been longing for this particular child in the process of adoption and, you know, waiting and preparing. And I had a sense that I wasn't really allowed to feel anything but grateful. You know, how Mm -hmm. could I feel frustrated or scared or, or doubt that I had done the right thing because it was so hard and confusing because we didn't know each other. You know, I didn't know what she needed when, or, um, but it was hard for me to let myself feel those things. I, I had a real sense that I was sort of doing something wrong. Um, if I felt all of that, which clearly is not true at all. I know now it's a very natural process to go through and important to feel it and, and look at it and process it and be able to talk about it with other people, all of that. But I didn't know that at the time, you know, I just thought, oh my gosh, I have to figure out how to make this work. (laughs) Right. Yeah. 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 So trauma and loss and, and that attachment, you know, part, all part of Claire's story. So absolutely. I I know in the book you detail, you know, the specifically the hard, the hard parts and the things that you, that you dealt with. Um, Just, can you kind of give us just sort of a, 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 because I don't want you to retell the whole book, right? Because it's, yeah, I fully recommend everybody get a copy and read it, but kind of just give us sort of maybe a little list of what were some of those early challenges even though you didn't know anything about trauma or even FASD at the time. Yeah. 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 It's a little bit hard for me to look back on it now and speak to it in the language that I would have used then, you know, because of the last 25 years of life that I've been on this journey. Um, There were things that, you know, now I know there are sensory issues or fatigue issues that um, we would be out in the world having a great time with her running and playing. And, and she tends to expend all of her energy and then just completely crash and be inconsolable, you know? And it was, so there were things like that. We'd come home from an outing that had been really fun. And all of a sudden she just would melt down and scream and cry. And I knew that she was hungry, but I couldn't get her to eat. And I didn't know, you know, that certain foods would work for her and other foods would not work for her. So I try to give her something and it just, it, she wasn't able to take in the nutrients that she needed or fall asleep like she needed to in order to sort of re-regulate herself. Again, I wouldn't have used any of those words then, right. but, um, and especially early, early on, she clearly was looking for, at that point, not her biological mother, but the American woman in Haiti who had really raised her for her first year of life. Um, just, where, wondering where she was, you know, looking for this her mom, really. And, and again, just this sense of sort of frantic, searching, inconsolable need that I, I couldn't meet. Um, so especially those first couple years, uh, when we were still living in Texas, where we were when she came home, that was kind of what it what it looked like when once she became a preschooler things ratcheted up quite a bit you know we moved again and um we thought she was waking up in the middle of the night not sleeping which had not been a problem before and we thought oh it must be time for us to get rid of her pacifiers (laughs) you know because it's waking her up because she's losing her pacifier at night and 
So if she doesn't need her pacifier, she won't wake up and we'll all sleep, you know, which was really logical. And she was two at that point and it seemed like a good idea. Terrible idea. You know, <laughs> just this, I mean, we took away the one object of attachment that she had that she needed, not knowing what we were doing, you know, um, and that really moving taking away her pacifiers and then her just not sleeping and really becoming increasingly out of control in her behaviors. Um, yeah. 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 Balanced out of course, by lots of joy and beauty and fun, you know, it was both always both. And yeah. Yeah. And it it always makes me think because depending on what lens we look through, right? We can look at behaviors and think, well, here is a child who's not grateful or being rebellious or disobedient or oppositional. And then we want to correct behavior and we want to discipline and right all of those things, but we're clueless coming into this about the trauma piece about how their brain maybe Mm -hmm. works differently. So along the way, we can can cause more harm than good. I know that was the case for our family with our, 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 absolutely. Yeah, Mm -hmm. absolutely. And I think for me too, I mean, I mentioned this in, in Tinderbox, the book as well, you know, it definitely triggered my own trauma that I had not really processed this sense of being out of control and feeling not that I was physically in danger with my two-year-old, you know, because she was so little yet. (laughs) Um, But that sense of, I have got to get control over this or I'm not going to be okay. You know, life cannot feel this out of control, this bad and, and still be okay. So it was really, yeah, super, super challenging to, deal with my own emotions that were coming up that I wasn't understanding and deal with her emotions that were coming up that I wasn't understanding and um, try to sort through all of that in real time uh, felt impossible. And so we definitely, and we made huge mistakes. Yeah. Huge mistakes. And instead of my goal at the time really being to support her and help her heal and understand, you know, where she was developmentally, um, emotionally, socially, physically, and all those ways, it became, how do I make this stop? You know, what is it going to take to make this behavior stop? Um, And I was stuck in that, honestly, for a really long time. Yeah. And I think that's common. Uh, I was there. I've spoken with a lot of other adopted and foster parents, and I, I think it can be a very common situation. Um, so you're navigating life with Claire, and you decide to adopt again. And I believe you you brought home next. Um, do you say Anna or Anna? Anna. Yeah. Anna. So Anna. I, I have an Anna, mm-hmm. but that's because she's Ukrainian, yes. and that's how it's pronounced there. So I right. just have to ask. So, yeah. so and Anna came, I believe, through adopting through foster care. Tell us about Anna. Yeah. So not really foster care, but we moved um, again. We realized that Claire really needed some stability. We thought maybe that would help things, you know, and we moved back to Texas from um, Canada where we'd been living and we really wanted another child. We just felt like our family wasn't complete. Um, It's funny, one of the writers that I was working with um, trading scenes and, you know, stuff with early on in the process of writing the book, read the passage about us adopting again. And she stopped and said, Lynn, I do not understand this character talking about me as the protagonist (laughs) of the book. You know, she said, I do not understand this character. Why why would this character do this again? Like, why would they do, why would she do another adoption? Um, And honestly, I don't know the answer to that, except that we, we wanted a family, you know, we wanted to, um, it wasn't the, you know, so often I think as adoptive parents, we hear, oh my gosh, 
what a great thing you've done for these mm-hmm. kids, you know, as if we're somehow right. saints or martyrs or something, which I want to just push against so yeah. completely. It's, I mean, the reality is that my kids have transformed me mm-hmm. and given me the life that I have. And it hasn't always been easy, but it's beautiful. And it is every bit as much them rescuing me, the language that people tend to use about adoption sometimes as mm-hmm. us. I mean, I'm putting my fingers in quotes, you know, rescuing yeah. them. There's, there's, there was no rescue actually happening, but um and really at the time, even just in my heart, it, we just wanted a family, you know? Um, so we ended up, um, we moved back to Texas and we did our, our second two adoptions then pretty close to each other. The, the little girls, they're not little anymore. They're um, almost 18 and 19 now, but yeah, so they're not very far apart. And they both were we adopted through an agency um, in Dallas that, um, yeah, so the girls both were living in foster homes before they came home to us, but they were in foster homes with this particular agency. Um, and our middle daughter only for a week and our older daughter, I mean, our youngest daughter, excuse me, um, for three months. So yeah, not long and not really in the foster care system really just in the system with our agency. Yeah. Yeah. So when, when Anna came home, she she was a baby, um, baby, baby. She likes to say, mom, you know, I'm your only baby, right? That's what she tells me. And, and, but she, were there challenges as she went from baby, baby to toddler, preschooler and on up? You know, all our kids are so different, which is true for every family, right? Whether it's biological or not, Um, they're so different. And Anna, she was so joyful and peaceful. And she has a way of being in the world where she really kind of sits back and observes and wants to just see everything that's going on, uh, that kind of thing. I think the biggest challenge was... um, really for Claire, that Claire, by the time Anna came home, Claire was almost five and she desperately wanted a sibling, but like most five-year-olds, she thought that meant she would have a perpetual playmate, not a tiny baby who slept and took a lot of our attention and didn't play, you know, at all. And also the interracial aspect was a part of it as well, because Claire's Haitian and Um, has a very dark skin tone. And Anna, though she was biracial, looked very white, Um, looks very, you know, she had blonde hair, blue eyes, looked a lot like us. People assumed she was our biological child and always commented on her blue eyes. And all of that together was a real struggle for Claire. Um, And Anna, you know, as she got older, was desperate for Claire's attention and idolized her big sister. And that was a very complicated relationship. So um, they're really great friends now, which is such a joy to see. They've definitely been through a lot of healing, lots of forgiveness and repair and and all of that. But, but it really wasn't until um, Anna was quite a bit older that we be able began to understand that she also had quite a bit of trauma and attachment um, stuff going on and, and also neurodiversity. We didn't really recognize her neurodivergence because it presented so differently from Claire's. Yeah. Mm. And then came your youngest who is Lucy. Tell us about Lucy. Lucy. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so Lucy um, came just two years after Anna, and yeah, Lucy, I'm just smiling thinking about her. She's such a delight. She's really, all three of our girls are just such extraordinary people. I guess lots of moms say that, you know, but in their own distinct ways. Somehow I think because they're not my biological children, I feel freer to talk about how great they are. 
you know, like that there, I didn't actually make them. So you can't take credit for it. Right. That's what I always say about something like that. <laughs> right. Right. They came yeah. that way. They yeah. came wonderful. So, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So Lucy, um, yeah, Anna adored her just, you know, she was her little baby doll really. And Lucy has these giant brown eyes that are, um, yeah, so captivating. She is biracial too, and looks very biracial. Um, she, one, she has one parent who's white and one who's black. And, and so that was a little complicating in our family as well, you know, um, just to navigate race that doesn't enter into the book a whole lot. I definitely put a little bit of it in there because obviously that's a big part of our story, but not what the book was about. Um, so I don't really go into that a whole lot in the book, but it definitely is a part of our story. Of how do you walk in the world with five people in this family who all look very different, present very different in, in the world and, um, and the, honestly, the world treats each of them very differently and all of us differently, depending on what combination we're in, you know, yeah. depending on who all's there, we are received very differently in the world. Um, so, yeah, but Lucy, I mean, we definitely knew after she came home, oh, this is our family. We're, we're a family of five and Claire adored Lucy too. And, uh, and from the beginning, it was clear that Lucy worked differently, you know, just the way that she engaged the world, uh, kind of the speed of, she has a pretty slow processing pace. And that was clear from the beginning. Again, I wouldn't have talked about it in those terms, but it just right. was clear that she was operating differently. Um, we didn't know what that meant yet. And honestly, Claire, you know, by the time Lucy came home, Claire was six, um, almost seven, really entering into those elementary years, which now I know are so challenging for so many kids um, who are neurodivergent. Um, that is not a word that I love, but I don't, we don't have a great word to talk about it, you know, but kids with brain-based differences who work really differently. Once they get into those elementary years, the expectations shift dramatically. You know, you think about how we set up preschools um, for kids and the expectations that we have for a typical development that includes lots of abstract thinking kind of coming on board, lots of executive function coming on board, those things that usually maybe not usually, typically, we assume happen during the elementary years. Um, when they're not happening or not happening yet, um, things get really complicated. And that was definitely true for Claire. And, and now I look back on it and I think, you know, in a lot of ways, Claire and my husband, Jeff, and I, the three of us were working so hard to manage whatever was happening for the three of us, you know, for Claire at school and at home. And there wasn't a lot of space left for, we called them the littles at the time, you know, Anna and Lucy, they were just, they were kind of okay. There were things going on, but they were kind of okay. And Claire was really struggling. And I think it, as happens in lots of families, um, the kid who is really struggling gets most of the energy. And, yeah. and Anna and Lucy really rode with that for a long time. They were able to sort of, um, yeah, exist pretty peacefully when we needed them to. Yeah. And then they become the elementary years and middle school years and high school right. years and the whole thing kind of you know, yes. goes, goes crazy. I can, I can um, attest yes. to that myself. Yeah. One of the things I love that you did in your book, and I'm assuming it was very intentional, right? As you unpacked your story, I was able, because I'm also a facilitator of the facets or a behavioral model and, and what yeah. I know about the primary symptoms of FASD, you, you know, yeah. you, as you describe things that were going on, you were, it was almost like you were dropping breadcrumbs, right? Sensory mm. issues, difficulty with transitions, 
high metabolism, sugar cravings. I made yeah. a list here. Need for structure, problems with math, social problems at school, memory yeah. problems. Um, of course, you always were very were very intentional about describing their strengths because they all have strengths. Mm. But because of the lens we can look through now, understanding the neurobehavioral model, right? We could, yeah. I could, I recognize those right away as, ooh, we're a reader who isn't as familiar. Mm would recognize all of those things probably and say, oh yeah, my kid too, but not really realize mm -hmm. yet until you unpack it later in the story that those are actually primary symptoms of FASD. Um, and, and you were a licensed- Okay, so Go ahead. Sandra, you just gave me goosebumps. I just have <laughs> to interrupt you for a minute and say, oh my gosh, I did it. But yes, it was inc very, yes. very intentional along the way to say, yeah, I need this example and this example yeah. and this example. Um, yeah, because I think that is what we all experience, but we have no idea what we're experiencing, right? Exactly. So, yeah. Exactly. And you yeah. are a social worker, yeah. right? So you're a professional. Yeah. But you and my still... husband's a marriage and family therapist. Like right. we thought we had it, right? Yeah. yeah. We you thought have... we've yeah. got this. You've got yeah. this. But yet you didn't know anything about yeah. FASD. Yeah. So how did you come to learn about fetal alcohol spectrum disorders? Yeah, so interesting. Um, so when Lucy, our youngest, was nine, yeah, it was just really clear. Again, we'd entered those elementary years with her um, and her particular developmental timeline that she has is um, at least at that point was lagging a lot behind her peers. And um, yeah, I was so frustrated just not knowing what, how we were going to help her grow up really, you know, and in the midst of that time, one of my dearest friends who adopted a child at the same time that Anna came home, they came home from the same agency around the same time. And we really raised all of those babies together. And her oldest child was really, really struggling in a lot of ways too. And it was through them, actually a friend of theirs who after one really difficult visit with them, you know, um, transitions and different mm -hmm. schedules and different people around can be so challenging um, for all of us, but especially for people who are neurodivergent, you know, to have everything shifted. And for their family, that was true too. And it had been especially that way on this particular visit with their friend. And that friend went home and just started diving deep for them to say, to try to figure out what is going on here? You know, why is this so hard? And my friend had tried a thousand things to make mm -hmm. things better, to change the behaviors, all of that. Um, and none of it had been helpful at all. And, and so this other friend called her one day and said, okay, I need you guys to sit down. I need to tell you what I found. I think this is FASD. And both my friend and I had never heard of FASD before, you know, and we had just done a gajillion hours of research and done all the things already trying to figure out what was happening in our families. And so I started really doing some research on it for their family, looking at, okay, what is going on there? They are a part of our family, you know, as we're raising our babies together and I'm a social worker. So I start to research, how do we solve this? You know, how do we handle this issue? And and as I read, um, I read lots of books, but especially there's a book called, um, oh gosh, the name has just escaped me. I think of it as the octopus book because there's an octopus on the cover of the book that came from the UK about fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. I read that first and thought, oh, I, this sounds really familiar. Mm -hmm. And then I read Diane Malbin's book the same day as I was just reading all this different stuff. Um, and when I read Diane's book, I think partly because she's a social worker, you know, her language and way of talking about it made so much sense to me. And I realized, so interesting, I did not realize it was what was going on with Claire, but I saw Lucy in the book, our youngest so completely. She was nine at the time and it just described her perfectly. And yeah, I, 
I turned to my friend that day and said, what are we going to do? This is, you know, this is me too. You know, Mm -hmm. this is our family too. And um, yeah, that's really what set us on the journey of figuring out what is fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and what do we do with it? And and what does that mean for us and our lives and our kids and their lives, all of that. Yeah. Yeah. So man, I, I could not ever say thank you enough to Diane Melvin. I've tried, I say it all the time, you know, (laughs) but yeah, she completely changed our lives with her really seminal work on FASD. Yeah. And trying differently rather than harder, the little purple book. Yes, yeah. That's just what I was going to add. Yes. So and, yeah, and yeah. Rec- I recommend it to every foster and adoptive parent trying differently rather Absolutely. than harder. Um, it's, it's that little purple book that holds so many yeah. answers to that we've all been yep. searching for. So do any of your girls, Lynn, have a diagnosis uh, on the FASD spectrum? Two of them do. Yeah. Um, ARND, so that's alcohol related neurodevelopmental disorder, which is one of the diagnoses. Uh, yeah, under the FASD umbrella. So FASD still is not a diagnosis, actually. Right. I mean, I know that you know this um, <laughs> in the US. Um, but ARND is right now closest, yeah, that we get in most cases. There are lots of other ways to to diagnose it as well, but two of them do, one of them does not, um, but probably should. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. But, you know, it's interesting, the diagnoses, we talk about this a lot at facets that, you know, sometimes we just can't get the proper diagnosis. um, And we end up with lots of other diagnoses. Mm -hmm. And there's a real balance between the need for accurate diagnosis so that, I mean, both so that there's understanding and appropriate accommodation and also for the sake of prevention so that more people do know about FASD and understand um, the impact of alcohol prenatally. And that is all very important. And at the same time, what we fundamentally need to know is that there is a brain that's working differently. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter why. It doesn't matter whether that was through exposure to alcohol or drugs or a lack of oxygen at birth or genetics or, you know, there are thousands of ways that brains get changed. Um, and it's really recognizing that, that there's a brain that's working differently than we typically assume brains work. And it's our job to accommodate that in the same way that we would if someone had legs that were working differently or arms or eyes or any other part of the body that was working differently. Yeah, exactly. And I know, like many of us, you took a deep dive into FASD to help your family and then obviously went on to help so many others. You you became a certified facilitator of the FACETS neurobehavioral model Um, So would you just for our listeners who might not know, and if they listen regularly, they know because I talk about it all the time, but (laughs) would you share a a little bit about the neurobehavioral model so that our listeners will understand what we're talking about? Absolutely. Absolutely. And you're right. I did a real deep dive. You know, that's um, definitely what I did. And I landed on the neurobehavioral model because I found it to be I think the thing that was most in alignment with my own values, you know, um, I want to come from a strengths perspective. I want to look at what's going right and what is um, most helpful. How can we be most respectful and honoring of people? How can we accept diversity in all of its forms? Um, And I found all of that in the neurobehavioral model. So after really years of going through all kinds of different models, including an attachment and trauma, which I still think is very, very important. Yes. And in our situation was not enough. You know, we understood trauma and attachment and we really reoriented our life around trauma informed parenting 
but because we didn't understand that there were fundamental differences in our kids' brains, it, it wasn't enough. So it wasn't until the neurobehavioral model really became what we oriented our entire lives around. Um, we didn't see the kind of transformation that we have seen since then. So, um, and I would say in a nutshell, the neurobehavioral model really says, you know, the brain equals behaviors. That's, you know, neuro is brain. Behavioral obviously is about behaviors. And it's about understanding that all of our behaviors are symptoms of brain function. And if we can look at it that way and get really curious about what these behaviors are telling us about how the brain both was formed and is functioning, then we can um, look at strengths and build on the strengths that a person has and add into that accommodations based on areas of skill that might be lacking or, um, yeah, things that don't work because the expectation is that everyone would fit into our sort of one size fits everyone world. You mm -hmm. know, it isn't that, I mean, my youngest daughter really doesn't like the word disability and there's a lot of um, important conversation around language that we need to have, you know, that word disability is, um, it's a tricky one because some people believe that it's really important to use that word so that it's really clear that we're talking about things that people are not able to do, not that they won't do, but that they can't do, which is something that right. we say a lot. And the other side of that coin is, is it truly that they can't do it or that they can't do it in this particular way, in this particular time, in this particular environment, which is what we want. We want people to be able to remember things without any supports. We want people to be able to keep going without needing to rest. We want people to be able to organize their lives themselves without any support, you know, that that's another part of the question. My younger daughter would say, I am not disabled. I just can't do things in the same way that you can do them. But that doesn't mean I'm not able to do them. <laughs> I right. just can't do them in the same way, you know. And that is foundational to the neurobehavioral model, I would say, is, um, yeah, how do we get curious about behaviors as symptoms that teach us about the brain that tells us then how do we respond and how do we put in place supports and change the environment in the same way that the Americans with Disabilities Act mm -hmm. says we need to do for everybody else who has a disability? You know, we would we have ramps for people who use wheelchairs. We have books in Braille for people who are blind. And it's exactly the same thing to say there's this memory impairment. And so we need an accommodation. And that's. I think that ultimately where the neurobehavioral model leads us. Mm, I love that. Great, great breakdown of that, Lynn. Um, so as you learned it and began to apply the neurobehavioral model with your with your children and in your family, um, how how did it help? Can you give us an example? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think this example is in the book. You can probably tell me because you just read it. <laughs> you know, it's all it all gets a little fuzzy, yes. at, at, you know, at this point. Um, but one thing that happened really early on that just stuck in my mind so vividly, um, we had so many battles with our older daughter around the eating. Um, she forgets to eat sometimes, you know, she doesn't have a real clear connection to her hunger, um, especially if there are other things going on. If, if she's feeling anxious or overwhelmed or tired, that connection seems to get lost. And, and the, also the understanding of if I eat, things will get better. You know, if I eat, I'll feel better. I'll think better. I'll whatever. That doesn't work really well for her. Um, and because we didn't understand that, 
we had lots of battles at the dinner table. You know, that was a place where, and, and especially in those years where control was really what I was after. I wanted to be able to control the situation, make the behaviors stop so that I felt okay about myself as a parent, about the safety of my environment, all of those things. Um, yeah, so the dinner table was a pretty charged place for us in a lot of ways. And one night at the dinner table, as I was learning all about the neurobehavioral model, um, our youngest daughter was jumping up and down and not eating and all over the place. And I was really tired and not very patient, all of that. And I'd asked her to, you know, eat in lots of different ways. And I finally said to her, sit. What did I, I said, put your bottom in your chair to eat, you know? And she jumped right back up out of her chair and started looking all around at the chair from every angle in every way. And so she'd done exactly the opposite of what I'd told her to do, you know, and if she had been my older daughter at that point, I would have probably yelled at her, sent her to her room, been furious. She would have been furious and frustrated. And it would have been the end of any possibility for connection or peacefulness in our home that night, you know, but because I'd learned about the neurobehavioral model, I had learned when things get really confusing get curious, you know, that's a, a sign that there's some missing information. And so get curious instead of angry or whatever. So I said to her, but, you know, what are you doing? What's going on here? That is not what I asked you to do. And she said, mom, you told me to put my bottom in my chair, but my chair is made of wood. There's mm -hmm. no way I can get in my chair. And it dawned on me because I've been reading a lot about literal thinking, you know, mm -hmm. that she thought it. what I meant was she was somehow supposed to be able to get inside of the wood that was her chair, um, which to my mind doesn't make any sense at all. And if my oldest daughter had tried to explain that to me, I would have thought she was lying and making up a very creative excuse, you know, mm -hmm. but I realized it was actually my mistake. I was not, and I didn't know how to at the time, speak literally enough for her to understand what I was asking her to do. And I kind of laughed and said, you're right. I was not being clear. What I want you to do is sit in your chair, on your chair. I changed that preposition. I want you to sit on your chair and not get up until you have finished eating. And she looked at me like, well, why didn't you just say that? And she sat down and ate her dinner. <laughs> you know, it was so clear that it was all about me and the language I was using and my own lens that I was looking through. And we had a peaceful dinner at the table and a lovely rest of the evening. You know, it was fine and so dramatically different than what would have happened with our older daughter before we knew anything about the neurobehavioral model. So something as simple as that, that truly changed our whole life, just us being able to not judge our children and not try to control their behavior, but get curious and understand why they were doing what they were doing and I think this is something we talk about all the time, again, at Facets, is it's a very different way to get to the place that we're all wanting to get to, which is a lessening of these really challenging behaviors. You know, my goal at that moment wasn't to control her and make her stop doing this thing I didn't want her to do, which was bouncing around the table at dinner time and not eating it was to understand how her brain was working and why that was happening. And the result of that was that she sat down and ate her dinner, <laughs> you know, that, so the outcome was exactly what I was hoping for in either method, but a very, very different and much more effective way to, to get there. Yeah. 
Yeah. I can't even remember. Is that story in the book? Maybe it, it is, is. It is in the book. I it is know. in the book. And I love oh, yeah. it. it. It made me chuckle because it's that whole, that they have a hard time with those abstract concepts and yeah, need absolutely. very concrete explanations. And it made me think I have a, yeah. my, one of my sons who has FAS, fetal alcohol syndrome, he's, he, he's able to work for our family business where he gets lots of accommodations and he started getting a paycheck yeah. when he was 18 and he would cash them and he would put all this money in his wallet. And that first summer I was like, you cannot carry all that money around. It's not safe. You're going to lose it. Somebody's going to steal it. You need to put it in the bank. And he just all the time. No, 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 no. Yeah. no. And then of course the day came where he lost his wallet. And when he finally found the wallet, yeah. there was no money left in the wallet. It was, and all it was, gone. It was yeah. like $1,200. And I was like, mm, all right, all right, we're so going to devastating. I know. And I said, we're going to yeah. go to the bank and we're going to put, open an account. You're going to put your money in there from now on. And he said, no, the bank just takes your money. Right. And I had to sit back. Which and is think, literally true. That is, is true. literally true. Right? Is, <laughs> yeah. They do. They do take it, your yeah. money, but they keep it safe. Yeah. And you can have it anytime you want. And now, of course, in the, with modern technology, I showed him, here's my phone app for the bank. I can click this hey. button and I can see all of my money there all the time. What goes in, what comes yeah. out. So we went to the bank and I helped him open an account. My my name is on there just yeah. so that he can have help with that because, you know, yeah. now, now he's going to be 20, but he still needs some of that help managing the money. Yeah. He's, he lost the debit card a few times in the early days of having that account. Of course. We yeah. worked it all out. Yeah. But it, and, and the other thing that was interesting was when he made the deposit, he had some checks and he had some cash to open mm -hmm. this account. And he said to the bank teller, when I come down to get money out, are you going to give me these checks back or can I get cash instead? Right. So again, more yeah. of that very, very abstract, yeah. so yeah. abstract. Yeah. yeah. And the things that we don't, we don't realize what is abstract and what's not, you know, if right. we don't, I mean, language is so abstract. That's something I think that also really changed for us that I, continually say to my kids when they're nodding at me, when I'm saying something, do you know what that means? Like, do you know what that idiom means? I wish I could think of, I just asked my daughter the other day, oh, I keeping an open mind, mm -hmm. you know, we were talking about some relationship um, issues that were going on. And I said, I started to talk about wanting her to keep an open mind. And then I realized, that doesn't mean anything. That's a very abstract <laughs> idiom, you know, to grasp. And I said to her, do you know what it means to keep an open mind? And she said, no, that is so weird. Like, what does that possibly mean? And those kinds of changes literally change your life. You know, mm -hmm. when you're able to have conversations in a way that there's true understanding rather than assuming that our kids know what we're talking about because they're nodding at us when we're talking about it, probably yeah. just wanting to make us be quiet, you know, because we're using so many words. Right. Um, exactly. We had yeah, that. So powerful. L last year, trying to teach my 17 year old son with FAS. So he's much younger developmentally. We were talking about what, what is appropriate words and boundaries mm -hmm you know, what's not appropriate. And he was nodding. We were having what I thought was this wonderful conversation. But then I suddenly thought to ask him, do you know what the word appropriate means? And he was like, no. <laughs> now, if I had stopped at, okay, we, you know, because he was agreeing with me that, yep, you know, we have yeah. to be appropriate. This is not appropriate, you know, but yet he didn't. So then I had to, you know, dial it down to, you know, good words, good boundaries. And that became right. our, our little mantra whenever we went anywhere, yeah. whatever we were doing, okay, we're going to go in here and we're going to use good words and good boundaries, right? So, yeah. um, but checking, yeah. checking, because just because they're nodding and right. can repeat it back to us doesn't mean they really understand. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's super challenging. I mean, I've been, you know, on this path for years and years now, and it, especially the first few years, it is hard hard work to learn how to communicate in a very literal way. It's not the way we communicate, you know, so right. it's really a big ask for us 
as support people in a person's life, um, which is, I think, a role that we often take on as parents, as well as being hopefully spending a lot of time just being the parent too, (laughs) you know, not always. I don't think our kids really want a social worker for a mom. They want a mom, right? So we have to be careful with that. But I think that it's big work for us to retrain ourselves. How do we think about things? How do we get curious about things? How do we communicate literally? Whatever it is that our kids need, you know. I have a a friend who has a child with an with FASD, and my friend is very funny and uses all kinds of idioms and a lot of sarcasm. You know, she that's just part of who she is. And she's been speaking that way to her daughter her entire life. And her daughter actually has some pretty amazing abstract thinking now. Like she's been able to build those skills along with her mom in a way that my daughter does not have because I don't communicate in that way. And probably because their brains are different, you know, but so we, it's so, it's so specific to each individual person, um, what those needs are and then how we have to train ourselves and how we have to change and be gentle with ourselves because it's Mm -hmm. not easy to learn to do all these things differently try differently rather than harder as Diane said. Yeah. Well, one of the things I had to learn, I I describe myself now, the way I describe it now is I was always the lecturing parent, right? So I had biological mm. children and then all these adopted five adopted kids. So it was like, you know, if they did something wrong, made a mistake or whatever it was that I wanted to address or correct, they've got the lecture with a whole bunch of words rushing at them. Right. You know, maybe right. it started with what were you thinking and why would you do that? And we don't do that. And we do this. And now you're going to have this consequence, you know, and none of it ever worked. And then as I learned the facets neurobehavioral model and learned about slow processing pace and how they're not even catching Mm -hmm. even a third Mm -hmm. of those words, right. In my lecture, it's all wasted on them. And Mm -hmm. I've learned simple scripts, you know, one instruction at a time, less words, And so I really yeah. had to learn a, a whole new way of, of, of communicating to them in a way that I, I didn't want to, I wanted to make the point, but not use a million words that they're not going to catch, right? We can simplify right. it greatly so that they understand and have the opportunity to, 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 to do the right thing and not punish them uh, because right. their, their brain works differently. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I would say, You know, I think that is one of the ways that my life and that I have been transformed on this path that I've been on with my kids that, I mean, who likes being lectured at? I don't, you know, I mean, I can keep up my, my processing is usually if I'm not too tired or hungry or whatever, pretty fast. And I can, I can keep up and abstract and do all of my brain does those things. Um, and I still don't like being lectured. I still don't like it when someone uses a million words with me. And, and I, I am so grateful that I have learned how to interact, not just with my kids, but with everyone in the world differently. You know, I think that's one of the really amazing things my kids have taught me is, we're all different and all of our brains work differently, whether we have a diagnosis or not, whether, I mean, I have all kinds of sensory processing issues that I didn't even know I had until I started learning about them and thought, oh, that's why I do this thing or that thing or whatever. I'm convinced that my husband has ADHD, which he's never been diagnosed with, you know, but it, his behavioral symptoms taught me that about him and our relationship is so much better because now I relate to him differently and I don't get, I mean, I still get frustrated, but I don't get nearly as frustrated when he forgets something or, you know, has um, some struggles with things that his brain just doesn't um, do in the same way that we, we've learned to accommodate each other. It's, I think that the neurobehavioral model is about all of us and all of life 
and all the people that we live with and work with. And um, it really can impact everyone and everything. That's the deeper I go into it, the more I realize that. Yeah. And I think that's one of my hopes, my dreams for this book. Um, I wrote this in an, an interview that I did not long ago about the book. My dream would be that there's like the, the place where the pebble first lands in the water is with adoptive families and in families that are in foster care, um, families like ours, you know, Mm -hmm. that would be where the, the stone drops into the water. But from there, it would really spread out so that any kind of neurodivergence and ultimately anyone who is wanting to walk a path of love and compassion in the midst of incredible challenges and suffering would know that there's a way forward and there's hope. Um, And that that's all of us, right? That's everyone across the planet. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what diagnosis we happen to have, but, and not that, you know, um, not that there's a magic wand that makes it all easy you know, our life is, is still incredibly challenging some days and we're constantly needing to be creative about how to respond to what's happening right now. Um, and as we all go through different developmental stages, those things change. I think that's one of the brilliant things about the neurobehavioral model and also something that is often frustrating for people. <laughs> you know, it's not about do these 10 things and then everything will work beautifully and brilliantly and everything will be great. (laughs) You know, it just, it just doesn't work that way. And, you know, as facets, as facilitators of the model, we are often not giving the answers, but trying to help people think about things differently and come up with creative solutions, because that's what we're going to have to do for the rest of our lives for ourselves, for our kids. You know, one of my, my oldest daughter, I mean, she's, yeah, so they all are so extraordinary, but my, my oldest is she's 24. And there was a day when I just, my highest goal was that she would stay alive and that she would have a relationship with someone one day, knowing that it wouldn't be me, you know, that it couldn't possibly be me because our relationship was so strained Um, But those were my highest goals for her. And now she is in a relationship with a lovely young man who, um, I mean, they have an amazing relationship, amazing communication. They really love each other so well. And she graduated from college a year ago because that was her goal. I tried to get her to take a break from school because it had been really challenging and she is starting a graduate school program um, this month in child life. She wants to be a child life specialist and work with kids mm. in the hospital to help them feel safe and secure and be an advocate for them like she had when she was in the hospital at one point. It's just, it's extraordinary. She's happy and she lives on her own. Um, and not that any of those things are the standard of what makes it work. You know, I think lots of kids don't need to go to college. That's not something that's necessary for everyone to live a happy, healthy, engaged life that we would call successful for her. It's what she wanted. And she's taken a long time to get there. We've worked really hard together to figure out, okay, what do you need in your life? to make this work? What kind of accommodations do you need? What kind of environment do you need to be in? What, how does it, how does it work? And it's been a slow, often very messy process. Um, But the neurobehavioral model is what gave me the framework, the paradigm that we like to talk about it so that I knew how to ask those questions and find those answers 
for her for this particular stage in her life. Um, and the same is true for my my younger two daughters too. Our middle daughter is, um, she's 19 and she is in a cosmetology program mm-hmm. at the college in our town. And she's brilliant at cosmetology. She's always been really artistic. She loves working with her hands. She loves all of it. Um, and so we're figuring out how do you do that? How do you get to work with your hands in that way and also take the test that gives you your license to do that, you know, in a right. way that um, doesn't fit great with how our brain works. So how do we creatively approach that? Um, and our, our youngest daughter is almost 18. She just decided that she wanted to take herself back a year in school. This is She's so extraordinary. She did some online school for a while and she did really well with it. Um, amazingly, it really worked for her as it also does for my older daughter, which is interesting. You know, we have, there's a lot of conversation around how online school doesn't work very well for um, kids who are neurodivergent. But I would again say all kids who are neurodivergent are different. We Mm -hmm. have to know them to know whether it's going to work for them, you know. Right. It worked for her well, but she felt like she wasn't learning the way she wanted to learn. So she put herself back a year. She's going to do her junior year again in our giant public high school where she has always wanted to be um, and to navigate it. And so now we're figuring out creative ways to support her in that environment and to create an environment there that fits with, with who she is and how she works. It's not easy. It's, yeah. it's big work for all yeah. of us, yeah. especially like, for them. Yeah. And like, and, and like you mentioned, every, every, every individual with an FASD, every, every um, Absolutely. neurodivergent individual they're not all going to go to college, but it's not that they can't ever go to college, right? It really depends on the individual Absolutely. and with proper accommodations, yeah. they can all be very, very successful. Um, yeah. Yeah. So um, I think the book is be- brilliantly written um, because, mm, you know, we, you. Get, we get caught up in the adoption story. We love to read those um, and, and, you know, you describe those challenges and experiences that you faced and like I mentioned earlier, you peppered all of those primary symptoms of FASD throughout the book, um, you know, without telling the reader the behavioral problems were actually symptoms, right? We kind of figure that out at the end mm-hmm. along with you. Um, and then we discover, um, you know, and I think a lot of times as we're on this journey and we're trying to figure our kids out and what's going on. So we, 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 we follow that journey with you. So I recommend Tinderbox. I have a copy, whether, I don't know if this will be on YouTube or not, but we'll, we'll um, have a copy. I highly recommend it. Lynn, where can our listeners pick up um, a copy of Tinderbox? So it's officially out September 12th, but it is available for pre-order right now. And I think they probably will be shipping out early. So, but I mean, it will be in the next few weeks anyway. And it's really available everywhere. It's I love bookshop.org, um, which is a place online where you can order books and it supports independent bookstores. Um, it's at Barnes and Noble and Target and Amazon, everywhere. Yeah, it's it's everywhere. It will be. That's my yeah. hope that yeah. it will get everywhere, <laughs> you know, so... Yeah, and, I'd love for people to request that their own bookstore in their town carry it. That would be wonderful. Or the library there. It's on um, Kindle as well. There's an audio. Um, the audio book is not out yet, but will be. It it's it'll be a little bit behind the digital and print versions. But yeah. yeah. And what about? Do you have a website? Where could our listeners connect with you? Yeah. Yeah, so it's just my name. It's www.linalsup, one word, L-Y-N-N-A-L-S-U-P dot com. Um, and there's a contact me button on there. 
Um, so if you do that, I'll get an email from you and, and we can connect. Yeah. And I am having a virtual book launch, which I'm super excited about on September 12th. And if you're interested, it's going to be, you know, a Zoom call. We'll be in a Zoom room together and get to talk a little bit about the book and read some of it. And we'll have prizes and all that kind of thing. So that's happening September 12th. And if you're interested in joining us, please do. You can, if you sign up on my website to stay connected, um, you'll automatically get an email with a link to that. Or you can just email me and. I can get you a link to it too. Yep. Wonderful. And we'll put links to your website um, and also to the facets website, facets.org. Yes, yes, the absolutely. Show notes, in the show notes for this um, episode. And um, I wanted to ask you a question because this is so important as well. Um, and you talked about it in your book, right? How you learn to take care of yourself, uh, you know, mm. emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually, um, because it, yeah. it's a very difficult road for us parents to travel. And I know some people hear the word, hear the, hear the term self-care and shut down. Right. Um, but yeah, you yeah. Know, share with us a little bit about that part of your journey, because it was really a key part. It is a key part of your story. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, it is a tricky question because people hear self-care and they think, oh, you mean I should take a bath at the end of the day or, you know, something like that. And I think the truth is that self-care is different for each of us, um, depending on who we are and how our own brains work, what they need, you know, and it, and it changes um, as the seasons of our lives change too, what's available to us and what's not. Um, so I think it's key to be really creative. I think for me, the driving force behind that in my life has been the many, 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 many moments when I was not able to be who I wanted to be um, with my kids, you know, when I was not able to love them well, because I was being really reactive, because my own stuff was triggered, um, all of those things. And the neurobehavioral model is very, very challenging to implement and it's impossible if we're not also looking at ourselves, looking at our own reactions, and, and also looking at the places where we find moments of life and joy and hope in the day. And some seasons, those are tiny, tiny places, you know, but I would say that learning to turn toward those places where we are seeing light and hope and beauty. Um, that is what self-care is to me, you know, noticing that maybe having someone in your life that helps you notice that, you know, I'm also a spiritual director and that happened because I was looking for a spiritual director that could help me notice those things, you know, and help me. And that's someone that I met with once a month who, just asked me good questions and helped me notice, oh, I feel better if I get up a little bit earlier and take a 10 minute walk outside by myself. I'm able to be more peaceful, more loving, more kind in the way that I want to be. And so I do that, you know, I, at one point my girls, um, did swimming lessons. And so I started taking swimming lessons alongside them so that I could be in the pool too and get some exercise. And man, water has an amazing way of drowning out the world, you know, around you. And that became for me a way that I could take care of myself and, and be the best version of myself possible mm. that I wanted to be in the world. So yeah, definitely that is a part a vital part of this, of this path. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Lynn, as we wrap up and I, I feel like I could just chat with you all day long about all of these. Yeah. Things. It would be really fun. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. I could talk about it all day long too. <laughs> yeah. But as we wrap up um, and, and because a majority of our listeners are adoptive, foster kinship caregivers, yeah. would you offer yeah. 
us some advice, some encouragement as we're on this journey? Absolutely. Um, and that actually is why I wrote Tinderbox. Um, it definitely includes a lot of pain and challenges and, and suffering, unnecessary suffering because of our ignorance, um, for sure. Um, but there is so much hope. There is a way forward, you know? Um, and I think that adoption um, and foster care, kinship care, are a very particular road to walk. Um, I think for me, acknowledging that, acknowledging really being able to be present and aware what's actually happening, the really challenging parts and also the really beautiful parts, paying close attention to all of that and accepting what it is and knowing that we don't have to do it alone. I think mm -hmm. that has been such an important um, part of me finding hope, you know, finding Diane's book, finding um, facets, getting to be a part of that community, surrounding myself, not just by people that are, um, that have a similar story to mine, but that are wanting to respond to that story in a similar way has brought a lot of hope to me, to my life. I think there are, um, there are groups within the adoption and, and foster care world that become places where we can vent about what's really hard. And there's something really important about that and also can be very destructive for us and our nervous systems if all we um, end up focusing on are the challenges. You know, we end up really torn down rather than lifted up by that. So. I would say, yeah, choose wisely, but find your people, you know, find the people who, and, and they're out there. Absolutely. And things like Zoom like this have really, really helped us to be able to connect and be on this journey together and learn from each other and learn from our kids. And um, yeah, there's a lot of beauty, a lot of hope amidst the the pain and the challenges for sure. Yeah. We just have to sometimes look for it intentionally. Right? Absolutely. No question. No question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Lynn, thank you so much for sharing your story oh, today, yeah. for being on the podcast and for all that you're doing um, on behalf of the FASD community. It's, it's your book again, mm -hmm. Tinderbox. I highly recommend it. Um, we'll put links in the show notes so that our, our listeners can find it. Thank you so much again Wonderful. for being with us. Oh, thank you. It's such a joy to talk about. And thank you for all of your work, Sandra. It's wow. really incredible to get to be a part of a community of people who are all working so hard and really offering hope and and goodness and and practical help to the world, you know, it's really, it's so wonderful to be in your company and, and get to be a tiny part of your work. Thank oh. you very much. Oh, well, thank you. Oh, that was such a great conversation with Lynn. I hope you'll pick up a copy of her book, Tinderbox. Um, love how she masterfully wove the symptoms of FASD throughout her story without revealing that they were symptoms of FASD, just that they were, and they, they are behavioral symptoms. And that oftentimes it's what's driving us as adoptive or foster parents to try to figure out what is going on, where's this behavior coming from? How can I fix it? How can I stop it without really realizing where it's really coming from? So um, I hope you'll pick up a copy. I hope you were inspired by Lynn's story. I know that I am inspired by her um, and all that uh, that she shared in her book. And I thank you for joining us today for this episode of the Adoption and Foster Care Journey. 
In addition to inspiring you, we always love to equip you. So please make sure you go to our website, justicefororphansny.org, where you can check out our resources, our training that's available online or in person. I do travel. Um, so if you're looking to have me come speak at um, an event, an adoption and foster care event, teach a workshop on FASD, um, I'm available. You can reach out on the website. Um, we've included a link in the show notes, of course. Um, if you're interested in maybe wanting to learn a little bit more, but you prefer a one-on-one, -on -one, like a, a, a consulting or a, a coaching session on FASD, you can reach out to me as well. Um, you can reach me through the website or you can email me directly. My email address is Sandra Flack at justicefororphansny.org and I can connect with you there. Don't forget about the Hope for the FASD Journey support community, our online community, which meets three times a month. And we have a private Facebook group just for members. Um, so you can check that out as well on our website. Um, if you enjoyed this podcast, uh, please be sure to subscribe or follow, leave a review. We always love those. And if you would like to follow us on social media, you can find Justice for Orphans on both Facebook and Instagram and myself, Sandra Flack, I am there as well. So thank you again for taking the time to, to listen. Um, I'm so grateful to have you along for the journey. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Adoption and Foster Care Journey podcast brought to you by Justice for Orphans. We hope you were encouraged today. Please be sure to subscribe to this podcast and leave a review and share it with your fellow foster and adoptive parent friends so they can be encouraged too. Be sure to find and follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Justice for Orphans. And check out our website for vital resources at justicefororphansny.org.